start recording. All right, so today's lecture is on safety instrumented systems. Do any of you students out there in internet land uh, have any experience with a SIS system or have ever worked with or, or anything like that? How many of you have never heard of an SIS system before? That's one, two, three, yeah. So there's probably a good reason for that. Um, and this might not be good that I'm recording what I'm going to say, because sometimes my opinions are not necessarily the opinions represented by the producer of the show. Um, but safety instrumented systems is really, it's, it's kind of an, it's kind of an engineering function in my mind. Uh, it's, it's an assessment of, of a process control system um, to determine the hazards that are involved with a process uh, and, and then to design a, a system, uh, a backup system essentially that is there to prevent any type of uh, bad shutdown situation. So uh, we kind of look at safety instrumented systems as a, as a backup system. Um, those of you who worked on the distillation column, I don't know if you got a chance to open up the control panel for the distillation column. Um, but if you did, uh, you would notice that the, the distillation column has its own uh, rack in there with uh, its own regular I.O. And then underneath it, there was another rack um, and it was bright yellow and it was called the SIS rack. And basically it's a redundant system that's in place to uh, safely shut down a system uh, in case of failure of all the other process control devices. Um, it's pretty high level uh, stuff, uh, typically done in the engineering and design phase. Uh, when they when they build the process control system, they, they add the extra safety features into it in order to achieve a certain uh, safety rating. And we're going to learn all about it. Um, and I'm just going to read to you straight from the ILM here why uh, it's important for us to know this. So it says, why is it important? It says safety instrumented systems reduce the risk of accidents in industry and their consequences. You need to understand the special requirements of a safety instrumented system to properly maintain, troubleshoot, or configure these systems. And then it goes on to saying that this module describes how safety instrumented systems reduce the risk of an accident and explains the safety life cycle as set out in the standard. Uh, it also talks about the different ways redundancy improves the safety and reliability of the SIS and how uh, safety integrate, uh, integrity level rating is determined, maintained, and verified. So to me, that sounds been very engineering. Um, but I guess to put this in context, I had a buddy of mine over last night, and we were watching a, a hockey game and working on this truck. And I said, oh, yeah, i got to do this uh, SIS lecture tomorrow, and it's not one of my favorites. And uh, he's just a regular Joe like you and I, except he did take the tech. He is a technologist. And he's like, oh yeah, I work at, he works at Nova. And he's like, oh yeah, I've done, uh, I've done SIS system uh, analysis and stuff like that. So it is something that is possible for you to, uh, to you, for you to get into. Um, and I said, well, you have to do all this crazy math. And you'll see as we go through the ILM, there's all kinds of crazy math. We don't necessarily do it in the ILM. But he says, no, no, no. He says, yeah, the math is there. I remember it from school. He says, but basically now it's just a matter of charts. And you, and you look at it, you grab an instrument, and you say, okay, where does it fall on this chart? How does it relate to this chart? And then how does it relate to this chart? And then you can kind of give an assessment and then uh, apply a rating to it. So that's kind of the general idea of a safety instrument and system in kind of a nutshell. Uh, the ILM itself, um, super duper uh, involved, but uh, let's get into it and, then, and we'll show you uh, what, this, what this SIS stuff looks like. So I'm going to get the screen up here. And why am I not seeing it? Are you, there we go. Okay, so start up with what is uh, SIS and, and a short description of what I just finished talking about. Oh, look at that. Last day, we get some fancy animations here. So safety instrumented systems are specifically designed to protect personnel, equipment, and the environment by reducing the likelihood or impact severity of an emergency event. OK, 
Okay, they provide safe isolation or perhaps venting of flammable or toxic materials in the event of a fire or accidental release of fluids. So it's really a, a backup safety system in, in short. SISs can also be called emergency shutdown systems, safety shutdown systems, and safety interlock systems. And some of these terms may be more familiar to you uh, than an SIS would have been uh, as, as a term. Uh, emergency shutdown system is probably something that you can wrap your head around a little bit easier. It's just another way of uh, defining what a safety uh, integrated system is. So it's just a, a system that is there to uh, you know, provide a safe shutdown in the event of unusual circumstances. So in this ILM, there are a few acronyms uh, that you guys will need to uh, know. Uh, you can see a bunch of them here, SIS, all this one's here, all these wonderful acronyms. Oh, look, there's another one. Oh, there's some more over here, and another one, 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 and another one. So uh, if that didn't scare you, you're a bigger man than I am. Um, all of these terms are inside the ILM. Um, most of them are of minor importance to us. Um, again, for, for us, um, a general understanding of, of how an SIS system, uh, the theory behind why we need it and, and how we uh, define it and qualify it is, is as much as we need to go. Um, but some of these terms, uh, you'll, you'll notice again, some of these terms you'll, you'll, never, you'll never see, but uh, there are certainly a lot of them in this ILM. Okay, so orange stuff here. So safety instrumented systems here uh, are designed to comply with a certain standard. And these standards are the ISA S84.01 or the IEC 61.511 standards. These are uh, what SISs are written to. It's a very specific safety standard. And again, overall, the SIS is designed to reduce the risk of a hazard to an acceptable level. So every process has risk associated with it. Um, the idea is to design it in such a way that we can mitigate any potential hazards uh, and, and reduce any hazard to an acceptable level that we can deal with. Companies are obligated uh, to reduce the risk to something called, and if you listen, will be a little bit of a flashback from nuclear uh, measurement last year, uh, as low as reasonably practicable. So you try to do everything that is possible in a, in a practical sense. Uh, you might remember Alara uh, from last year as, uh, as low as reasonably acceptable, um, but for SIS purposes, it's as low as reasonably practicable. So a bunch of orange stuff on this screen here. Uh, the three different uh, levels of risk that they're, they're talking about here uh, are represented by the triangle on the right here. We have the first level, which is a broadly uh, acceptable risk. So this is stuff that we live with basically on a day-to-day on a -day basis. Like we know, uh, we know that we can lose a nitrogen blanket on a tank or something like that, but it's not really that big of a deal. So we can accept that. Uh, a little bit up from that is a tolerable risk. So something that we can uh, manage with certain uh, things in place. And then of course the top, level there is unacceptable risk. And the idea of a SIS system is to bring anything that's in the unacceptable risk area down into a tolerable or broadly acceptable risk area. And we do that by adding uh, different hardware and uh, equipment and redundancy and, and things of that nature. Okay, so to put that into some kind of perspective here, we have a, a fairly basic uh, PID uh, diagram here. Um, and they, they call these uh, BPOC, you know, basic process control scheme. I think I'll have it on the next, on the next uh, slide. But the idea is uh, we have a regular basic system here. And when they design it, they kind of say, well, we're going to design this uh, with minimal amount of instrumentation on it uh, on the pretense that we can expect maybe uh, one incident per year. Uh, related to failure of any of this particular equipment. So that's represented as uh, a decimal place as we look along this scale and you'll see scales uh, like this. So they're saying basic processes, we can, we can tolerate one incident 
per year. Uh, the goal basically for an SIS system long term is to try to get a, a process that may have a chance of having a problem once a year to get it way over here to where it would be likely that it'll have one major incident every 10,000 years. So the idea is to make it, of course, much, much safer. So if we look at this diagram here, we see we have some basic controls on it, temperature transmitter or temperature valve, level transmitter, level valve, uh, flow transmitter valve, pressure transmitter, uh, that kind of thing. It's relatively basic control. Uh, and we'll look at that in comparison to the next slide here, which has some additional equipment on it, which is part of uh, the SIS assessment. And they decided, well, in order to make it, uh, take it from one incident per year to one incident per 10,000 years, we have to add some stuff to it. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we added a couple of switches here. You'll see now we have a, a temperature switch, high, high, a pressure switch, high, high, uh, another temperature switch here, another pressure switch here. Uh, we've added uh, a, PS, a PSV on here. So we've added a bunch of different control elements uh, to our basic process. And by doing so, we move it from the potential of one incident per year to uh, a much lower risk level. And the general idea of the way it works, I'm going to try to talk to this in a very general way, because as you read through the IOM, it's very, very in-depth and can be very complicated, but I, I want to instill in you guys a, a pretty basic understanding of, of how this works uh, without getting you overwhelmed with the uh, kind of the engineering side of it. Um, the deeper engineering side of it, I want you to understand how it's done, but I don't want you to, uh, don't necessarily need you to be able to, to do it. Okay, so by adding different uh, elements to this, Every time we add something to it, uh, based on the type of equipment it is, it provides uh, another factor of safety that is a multiplier to the overall hazard frequency. So basically what they say is every time we add something to this, we increase the safety factor by uh, a factor of 10. So by adding alarms, we can, we can get it to the point where we'll have one incident every uh, 10 years by adding some pressure switches or a PSV that adds another layer when, and takes us to one incident for every 100 years and pay attention to the decimal places here. So one year, once every 10th year, 0.1, uh, 0 0.01 is one out of 100, 0 0.001 is one out of 1,000, and 0 0.0001 is one out of 10,000 as, as we're aiming ideally to get to one out of 10,000. But basically every component that we add provides another 10 factor of uh, safety to our to our system, and that's kind of the idea of a SIS in a very uh, general uh, general sense. So the idea is we add more things, hardware-wise, uh, software-wise, programming-wise, in order to take it from a once per year problem to a ideally a once per ten thousand year problem. Uh, so yeah, that's how that kind of goes. Okay, so uh, the goal here, uh, one incident every 10,000 years is the ideal design with a SIS. Um, we add the SIS control system now into it, and we'll talk about the, this component of it later. These are kind of hardware. I guess this is hardware device too, but this is uh, another complete control rack entirely, a redundant system uh, that only looks after these critical uh, devices that we've added on. The regular control system still looks after the regular uh, control elements that we had initially, but by adding in the extra devices here, we add uh, another controller that takes care of the logic uh, of what's going on in these additional systems. So it counts itself as another one of these factors. So multiply by 10, multiply by 10, multiply by 10, multiply by 10, and magically we appear at this uh, one every 10,000. Uh, years uh, for an incident. Uh, letter Z here, you'll see PZH. This represents the logic solver, and I think the next slide will show us what uh, logic solver is. So here's the logic solver. This is uh, exactly the one that we have in the control cabinet for the distillation column. And it is, as you can see looking at it, it's just a, a very specifically designed uh, PLC type rack 
that is used to look after that uh, additional emergency equipment. So its function here is to determine what action needs to be taken based on the information gathered from those elements that we added to the basic process control system. Uh, it has a necessity to be highly reliable uh, to provide fail-safe fault-tolerant operations. So it's essentially a bigger, better, more, uh, uh, I don't know what you want to say, tough or resilient type of controller. But it is essentially a controller that reads signal from the sensors and executes pre-programmed actions to the final control element, which is essentially a, an emergency shutdown sequence or, or something like that in order to mitigate uh, an overpressure or a wild flow or anything like that should the main control system fail to do that. Okay, so in order to come up with an SIS system, uh, engineering people generally have to go through uh, a big process and it's a few pages long in the ILM here and they describe it as the safety life cycle. Uh, and this really describes the process that goes into determining uh, an SIS system. It shows us the activities that need to be performed when develop developing the SIS. This is usually done uh, as the plant is designed or if we have a thought of adding a new piece of equipment, uh, you sit down and you do all this before you, before you order the actual piece of equipment, whether it's a distillation column or a pressure vessel or something like that, so that you know you get all the right takeoffs and all the you know, right points that you need to uh, have in place so you can add all that auxiliary equipment to it. So it starts out basically with a hazard risk assessment. You look at your process and you go, okay, well, what, what are the potential risks here? Uh, and then you, you know, kind of work your way through the process. What, what things can I do to make it better? Uh, so on and so forth. And this safety life, life cycle is describing the entire process from uh, start to finish um, of, of the SIS analysis. Okay, um, one thing to take into consideration, uh, this is all designed to, to try to mitigate uh, dangerous or risky situations. Um, you're never going to get them 100%. As we say here, absolute safety where risk is completely eliminated is impossible. But if you can get it down to one incident every 10,000 years, uh, that's pretty good. Okay, so the HAZOP process. Uh, involves identifying all the hazards as a team, so a collective, uh, a collective learning environment where everybody brings something to the table and hopefully you can identify everything. Uh, also identifying what can go wrong and how, and then identifying the consequences, and that's the basic idea of what happens in uh, HAZOP, and I think we've probably had uh, some experience with this. It's not much different than a tailgate uh, hazard assessment that you'll do before uh, performing an activity at work, except we're we're doing it on a process in this situation. So determining the risk, uh, this was where we started getting into uh, the hows and whys and, and uh, the uh, quantification of risk and hazards. And risk by definition here is the probability and severity of potential harm. And we use matrix, uh, different matrices in order to categorize risk levels. So you can see here, Frequency of occurrence uh, and severity of occurrence are two things uh, that are uh, the major factors that we are trying to calculate when we're coming up with an SIS system. So how often could this potentially happen? And if it does happen, uh, how, how bad could that possibly be? So by uh, assessing it, assigning uh, levels and, and stuff like that, we come up with a, we come up with a plan. <laughs> so the safety that we're designing is, is uh, provided by something called safety functions. And these functions are, are layers of functions, I guess, and they, they are called SIFs. So that's our first uh, little acronym that we have to deal with here. And it's one of the ones that you should probably know, uh, safety integrated function here. And these functions reduce risks to an acceptable level. So adding a Pressure switch, for example, is a, a function that is going to reduce the risk. Adding a PSV is a function that is going to help reduce the risk. Okay, an SIF is composed of both sensors, final control elements, and logic solvers 
that we have implemented in order to mitigate our risk or to bring us from once a year to once every 10,000 years. And SIS, the safety integrated system, is composed of a bunch of these safety integrated functions. Okay, these layers of protection start with safe and effective process control as a basic design, then they extend to manual and automatic prevention layers, and then they continue with the layers to mitigate the consequences of an event. And we'll see what these layers look like. I think I have a diagram. Um, they have something called a layer of protection analysis. It's in the ILM. Um, I can't comment on everything in the ILM or this would be a uh, hundred slides long. Uh, okay, safety functions are uh, classified by levels. So again, we, we mentioned earlier that each level is 10 times better than the previous level. Uh, and we call these levels safety integrity levels. And that's another term that's pretty important to you. And understanding the, uh, this particular table, uh, what is a safety integrated level? And what is this? What are these numbers here? This probability of failure on demand. Basically that's saying if, if I call on a, on a transmitter to do its job, what is the likelihood that it's not going to be able to do its job, right? So the idea again is we want to, we want to be able to you know go to a device and hopefully every time we ask a device for information, it's going to give us that information. But we say theoretically that you know once a year it's it's not going to give us that information. So if that's the case, then it gets a certain sill level, um, and then each sill level above that is of course ten times. Uh, 10 times better. So this is uh, this is saying we'll have uh, once every 10 years to once every 100 years, we're going to have a failure and that's cell one. If it's going to happen once every 100 years to once every 1,000 years, that's cell two. If it's once every 1,000 uh, to every 10,000 years, that's cell three and, and so on and so forth. So those numbers directly relate to here. So point one is basically a tenth and 0 0.01 is basically 100, and so that relates to this risk reduction frequency number on the other side of this table. So be sure to be able to tell me what a SIL uh, 1, SIL 2, SIL 3, SIL 4 is in relationship to this probability of failure on demand. So I'll be able to see, you'll be able to say, uh, well, a SIL 1 basically says that I, I have a probability of once every 10 years to once every 100 years or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but SIL4, the best, SIL1, uh, the, the least. Okay, the SIF sees functions, they add integrity to the system, and it's a quantitative measure that provides different levels of integrity. So the more equipment we add, the higher up on the SIL level that we get. Okay, so you'll start out with a uh, SIL level one, let's say, and then you add a pressure switch. Well, that'll bring you up to a, a two. Then you add a PSV that could bring you up to a three, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't want to get you overwhelmed with that, but there's lots of math in the ILM that shows you what that's all about. <clears throat> okay, emergency shutdown systems. We're just going to venture here really quick. I don't remember reading this in the ILM, to be honest with you. Um, similar to an SIS, um, they're designed to prevent flooding or uncontrolled process escape or fires. Uh, typically, an emergency shutdown system is limited to using a valve and an actuator to shut the system down. So it's a, a little bit kind of different than an SIS uh, in the fact that it automatically kind of shuts things down here. And again, you'll see it's got uh, different levels, uh, 3, 2, 1, 1 and 0, uh, all with different levels of, of severity, uh, ranging from a uh, local shutdown to a total, total shutdown entirely. Overpressuring, a uh, simple component that can be added to uh, as, a, as a safety integrated function to increase our safety integration level is a PSV. So PSVs uh, like this or even a rupture disc uh, can be used to, to vent off extremely high pressure should a pressure transmitter fail. Uh, it's, a, it's a function that is added into the SIS uh, in order to increase the SIL. Are you guys still with me? Yeah, still with you. It's, it's riveting, right? So how do we determine the safety and integrating level here? So what is the safety? What, is it, what does it mean? So it, it really is, 
it's really a multi-level thing, right? We have our basic process here, so basic process control system, and then we, we say, okay, this is potentially one incident every year. Then we add alarms to it, and now we're gonna look at one incident every 100 years, or 10 years, sorry. And then we add SIS into it, and then it's every 1,000 years, and then we add a PSV, and then it's every 10,000 years, and then so on and so forth and so forth. The idea is, is if we have any problems, we want to contain them, of course, before they get into a community response or a plant response situation where you're evacuating uh, people and workers and worst case scenario of a town next door. So it kind of builds, it kind of builds like this, if you looked at it in a, in a big kind of picture. Okay, the identification of the hazards uh, is involved in this uh, picture that we call here is called a, a LOPA or a layer of protection analysis. And this looks at our, our system uh, as, as a big picture. Okay, assessment of the risk of each of the identified hazards is involved when we're doing this layer of protection analysis. Um, and it's part of the it's part of that safety life cycle that we talked about several slides ago. What does it say here? An assessment of other independent protection layers uh, that may be in place. So this is again, this is just uh, assessing the, the situation or the system as a whole. So continuing along with the safety integrated level here again, they are a quantifiable measurement of risk and are used to establish safety performance targets for a system. So we can say, uh, I need this system to be a SIL-4 or I need this system to be a SIL-2 or a SIL-1. Uh, if we know what level we need it to be, then we can add and subtract uh, equipment to, uh, to change that SIL level to what we require. The effectiveness of the SIS as an independent layer is described in these terms here. These terms are similar to the terms that we discussed earlier, but it, it is uh, the probability that it will fail to, that spelling, perform its required function when called upon to do so. Okay, so again, the whole idea of an SIS uh, is to take over when all the other things that we expect to do their jobs fail to do their job. Um, the SIS hopefully is far better than that, and its probability to fail would be much less than our basic process control system. Okay, this is referred to of, as a probability of failure on demand, which is a number that's assigned to, uh, I guess, a, a device. Uh, in order to be able to calculate the safety integrity level. And it's probably at about this point when your head starts to spin. Okay, so how do we select a, a SIL selection? Uh, it's, it's a process again, the, the layer protection uh, team will get together, and they'll assess the situation and determine uh, the target frequency of the hazard and again, uh, it depends on how serious the hazard is, but for theoretical purposes, we'll say you know, once every 10,000 years. They will also identify all the initiating causes. So uh, a, high, a high temperature uh, will cause the fluid to boil and vaporize, which will increase the pressure and so on and so forth. Uh, they'll look at the control system and what's already on it, and they will assign uh, credits to any of the current devices that are in there. So uh, without getting into too much detail, every device you put on there is in some way going to help protect from uh, an incident. So they have a factor, like each, each device uh, is 0.1, for example, and you can do 0.1 uh, times one year will give you 10 years, and then add another one and it's 0.1 times 10 years will give you 100 years, et cetera, et cetera. It's, lots of this stuff is, is kind of repetitive, but the idea, again, is to add devices in there in order to bring uh, the probability of a, of a bad thing happening lower and lower and lower. So they look at the system and they'll assign credits for any uh, independent protection layers that are already in place. And then they'll get into some uh, fancy math. So if they need to find out the probability of failure on demand, they take uh, the credits from all the devices that are there, uh, the 
the failure rate that they're looking for, one every 10,000 or whatever it is, and then this is the current state of the nation. But don't get too worried about it. There is no math that you actually have to do. Uh, we're just kind of describing the process that is done you know, in order to get us to that safety integrity level that we require. Okay, uh, so how do we know uh, what level of safety integrity do we need? This is laid out for us in a document called the Safety Requirement Specification. And Safety Requirement Specification is simply a document package that contains the functional and integrity requirements for each, each safety integrated function so that the facility can be spec properly when we build it. So I mentioned this earlier, but it includes all the equipment specifications, including uh, the fault tolerance of the device, and we'll define fault tolerance in a bit, but basically it's its, its ability to, uh, to go through some issue without failing, obviously. Uh, functional testing requirements, so uh, stroke testing and uh, things like that we'll talk about later. Common cause failures and di diagnostic capabilities of the hardware, so some hardware uh, again, we're talking fourth year here uh, and digital, lots of it comes with diagnostic features uh, and those come into play also as well. Uh, this also includes commissioning and maintenance considerations. So it's a whole, it's a whole package. Okay, component selection. When we're picking components in order to make our system better, we have to look at the components uh, in terms of, you know, some different things. And I've kind of condensed uh, geez, I think three or four pages here. Let me just have a quick look. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, this is, I kind of condensed three or four pages here into this one slide. Uh, it defines a bunch of different things about components specifically. Uh, I just picked some of the, the common terms out of there because uh, I know I mentioned it, I wanted to uh, define them for you. Uh, fault tolerance is a systems built in capability to continuously work properly in the presence of a limited number of hardware faults. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Functional testing, uh, sometimes called proof testing, is a periodic activity that verifies the operation of the SRS. Um, and some of you may have uh, had uh, experience doing this. Uh, you know, you'll go out there and you'll, you'll do a stroke test on your ESD. Uh, that's, that's a functional test or a proof test. Uh, making sure that the hardware that you put in there to provide the safety actually works. Uh, and then the last definition from the previous slide here was common cause failure, uh, which is a failure that is the result of one or more oops, events that cause coincident failures of two or more channels leading to a system failure. So this is basically uh, something happened that caused the pressure transmitter to fail and caused the temperature transmitter to fail and could have possibly cause the flow transmitter to fail. So when you think of something like that, you think, oh, well, maybe I lost, uh, maybe I lost power or my processor failed or, or something like that. And if you didn't have uh, a redundant PLC beside it, or even if you did have a redundant PLC and the power failed, you could be SOL, uh, not to throw another abbreviation in there, um, but then you would have your SIS system, which would be perhaps on a, a UPS. I'm speculating here because more likely your, your redundant PLC would be on a UPS as well. But again, this is an additional layer above and beyond uh, regular redundancy. All right, so those are just some terms. Okay, safety integrity levels. Uh, describe safety integrity levels. We've already started into this here. Um, and we talk about some of these calculations here, and you can see my um, my personal belief on this is kind of eh, but uh, it is important, and I, I think we've kind of nailed this down already. But let's we'll see what I got here. Uh, mathematically and engineering wise, what happens in the background? How do we determine the SIL uh, related to the function? Uh, it's calculated using the PFD. Uh, yes, wonderful. The probability of failure on demand. And HFT, which stands for Hardware Fault Tolerance, which just basically means how robust is our, is our instrument? Can it take some abuse? We don't do this, thank God, but it basically looks like this. We take the probability of failure demand average, which is um, 
the probability, uh, so a, a factor that's related to the sensor, a factor that's related to the logic solver, and a, and a factor that's related to the final element. These are all basically uh, in there. If we looked at the, the pressure transmitter, uh, it's connected to a, a pressure a pressure control valve. Uh, and then both of those things are, are I.O. that go into the, the logic solver. So each of these individual components has a certain number uh, assigned to it, and that is the probability of failure on demand. So it's a dependability, it's a dependability number. Like how often do you think a transmitter is going to fail? Probably not that often, but you know, probably more often than the logic solver would fail. Uh, how often will a control valve fail? Well, probably more often than a transmitter. So we give them numbers. Okay, so uh, it's, it's, it get, can be ugly, can be messy. Uh, it's based on a bunch of different things such as failure rates, common cause failures, uh, proof test intervals, redundant architectures, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, enjoy the reading. Uh, some random terms out here. Uh, I threw this one out here because I had never heard of a spurious trip uh, before this ILM. It's not orange uh, or anything, so it's not of any major significance to us, but uh, I like the word, so I threw it in here. A spurious trip is a trip that had no actual cause for a trip, and I can't give you a real good example for that, but, you know, uh, a ghost or lightning or gremlins or something like that maybe would fall in that category. Objective three, uh, redundancy as it applies to SIS. So SIS is in itself uh, a form of redundancy. Um, but let's look at what we're looking for here in this objective. Okay, redundancy, we know, we know what redundancy is already. It refers to a parallel or secondary system that takes over when the primary fails. So that things continue going on without any major issues. Uh, the components of a safety integrated function can fail in two different ways should they happen to fail. The first way is a safe failure, and that's hopefully the way things happen. Uh, it's an accidental shutdown uh, when no actual trouble exists, so it's ideal situation. Uh, the other way it could fail here is a, is a dangerous failure, uh, and this puts the SIF into a non-functional state where it cannot respond to trouble, and that, of course, is uh, problematic. So. If this happens, we're okay. If this happens, we're, we're not okay. So we have to do something about that. And redundancy is the answer. Redundancy makes the shutdowns less likely by decreasing the probability of failure on demand with the PFD uh, to safety state uh, or spurious trips and also increases the fault tolerance of the function. I know this is probably making your brain twitch at this point in time. Okay, hardware fart fart tolerance fault tolerance explained. Hardware fault tolerance explained. Okay, hardware fault tolerance is measured in three degrees, zero, one, or two. Zero means it can survive any dangerous failure. One means it can survive one dangerous failure and two means it can survive two dangerous failures. Just throwing that out there here. Okay, redundancy. Here we get into some interesting, uh, interesting stuff. So talking about redundancy uh, can involve a, a number of uh, different components. Okay, redundant components and different architectures can be used to increase our safety integrated level rating. So for example, if I had uh, one level transmitter, one temperature transmitter, and one pressure transmitter on that basic vessel um, diagram that we saw at the beginning of the PowerPoint, it would be a pretty basic safety integrity level. It would be like a level one. If I added a redundant or an additional pressure transmitter, an additional level transmitter, an additional uh, temperature transmitter, well, I would by by nature of the factors associated with those particular devices as a multiplier to our SIL rating, move us up to like a SIL 2 or a SIL 3, for example. Um, that's in very general terms. Uh, we're going to look at some very specific ways of doing that here 
uh, in a second. So basically, two devices gets you to a cell one. Uh, we add them together, we can combine them, and then we can achieve level two. So they're both they both have the same hardware fault tolerance number. They both have the same probability of failure on demand. But if this is a point one and this is a point one, point one times point one is point zero one. So it's now technically ten times better. Therefore, you move up one level in the cell. Keep it simple, stupid is the way they kind of do this one. Sadly, uh, we're not. We're going to take you into what the heck does does this here mean? And we're going to look at these configurations, and these are called moon configuration, and, and it represents. I'll just wait because there's a slide on this. Okay, best result. Uh, well, something that's important to throw in here, I guess. Best redundancy designs use dissimilar technologies. So, for example, here I got images of what looked like uh, Rosemount 3051 differential pressure transmitters. They're saying if you want to make this system even better than just throwing an extra one in there, you make this a Rosemount 3051 and you make this one a uh, Endress and Hauser uh, differential pressure transmitter because the, they won't have the same problem. You know, maybe this one's got a a weakness in the board that can fail when it gets hot and maybe this one has a problem uh, with the cell if it freezes or something like that but have them so that they have different issues associated with them so that the same thing doesn't take both of them out you know what i'm getting at there following me good all right let's look at what these uh crazy numbers in this chart here uh, has to do uh, with us Oh, it's not there yet. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do redundancy? What's the architecture for redundancy look like? Well, it's pretty standard, uh, just like any other redundant system that we've addressed earlier. So we can have redundant sensors, we can have redundant FCEs, we can have redundant logic solvers. All of these are in place to cover in case of failures, right? We can have impulse line blockages or breakages, electronic failures, corrosion, uh, damages, forced outputs, etc. This is why we have redundancy uh, in case we have any of these problems. So now we're looking at this moon architecture for redundant sensors. And that's what we, these numbers that we're talking about from that previous table. Uh, it's called moon architecture. And what the heck is moon architecture? M in moon architecture, M O N, and this is the M, and this is the O O, and this is the N. M is the number of components that must work to take the safety action, and N is the number of total components. So basically we're saying in order for us to execute the safety uh, shutdown scenario that we've designed, one out of one of the devices has to fail. In this case, one out of the two devices have to fail. In this case, two out of two devices have to fail. In this case, two out of three devices have to fail. And basically, it's just a way of describing what is required for a trip. And then by having these different combinations, we alter the hardware fault tolerance, right? If I have one device and it fails, well, clearly I have a fault tolerance of zero because I got, I've got no backup. Uh, one out of one with D, uh, D is for diagnostics, same thing. If I have one and it fails, well, I have no tolerance. I've got no backup, so it's a zero. One out of two, if one of them fails, I still have one, so it's got a hardware fault tolerance of one. Two out of two, if they both fail, I obviously have no more backup, so I'm at a zero. Two out of three, I still have one left, so I have a fault tolerance of one. It's, it's more in-depth, I'm sure, in the ILM, but I... I would just take it at that because that is uh, condensed uh, condensed knowledge from a couple pages of reading. So that's what moon architecture is. Uh, and it goes into a little bit more detail. And, and I contemplated uh, I contemplated throwing some more slides into this this morning uh, to kind of talk about it. But the reality of it is, is it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of a lot of words and a lot of reading for something that when you look at it in the ILM, you'll go, okay, I, I kind of get this. Um, and it basically shows you diagrams of, 
uh, you know, two switches, one switch, and and how the how the the signal would flow and how it would cause uh, the trip to actually happen. Okay, uh, redundant final elements. Uh, final elements can fail, obviously. Um, things like solenoid valve burnout, plugging on the solenoid valve, stickier type packing, blocked or crushed airlines, uh, seized valves, valve stems, corroded valves, etc. Uh, all all different problems that we can have with final control elements. Uh, and as such, if we're de designing an SIS, you'll likely have a redundant final control element. And uh, they go on to say here that final elements typically use one out of one or one out of two, which is basically saying I have either one valve and if it fails, we trip, or I have two valves and if one of them fails, we trip. Uh, I'm going to throw this. Yeah, I believe it's a typo, Daniel. I looked at that this morning, uh, assigned to that picture. You're like, huh, how, we got six boxes here. How does it get to be two out of two? Yes, I believe that is a typo uh, in the ILM as you're reading through. Um, that is, page, yeah, did you just say page 36? Let me just quickly there. Yes, you're absolutely right. Figure 22 uh, is incorrect. Um, but this, that was... Uh, Page 30, 35, 36, 37, 38, basically all talk about that moon architecture. So that would be too many slides for me to put in here. You guys would all be dead or sleeping or exploded by then. Um, so I didn't, I didn't include them, but it's, uh, it's a, a wonderful read. Uh, car seal, throwing this in here just because it's, uh, just because it's yellow and I didn't even find it in the ILM, to be honest with you, but it is a, it is an ILM question. I think most of us know what a car seal is. Um, when I think of a car seal, the one that immediately comes to mind for me is the one that's on my power meter outside my house or on my gas meter outside my house. You know, the utility company comes by and they put that little, uh, little metal clip uh, thing on there. They thread it through there and then they clip it and that's so that you can't get in there and uh, fiddle around with it. And, and mess it up. So that's a car seal. Uh, and in, in terms of a final control element, it does the same purpose. You put it on the final control element in order to restrain an actuator. And that's kind of a strong word because if you actually stroke, if you actually stroke the valve and it had a car seal on it, it would pop the car seal. Uh, and it's a way for you to tell if the, uh, the actuator has, has moved uh, in, its, in its lifetime. So car seal is used to restrain an actuator so it can't be moved without breaking the seal. And it's just a way of telling you uh, if in fact it's ever tripped. <clears throat> redundant logic solvers. Uh, again, just like we had uh, redundant uh, backplanes for a PLC or a DCS system, uh, same exact thing here for logic solvers because they are essentially the same. Um, of course, they can be pneumatic, relay, or programmable elect electronic systems. We're really at the point where we're talking about uh, a complete special SIS uh, PLC rack, right? A, a complete backplane with its own I.O., its own processor, its own power supply, uh, that kind of stuff. But we're saying, yeah, it can be it can be old school or it can be new school. So how do they how do they fail? Well, they failed the same way other hardware fails. Uh, software errors, memory corruption or loss, uh, I.O. could be forced could have communication errors, you could have main processor failure or board failures or power supply failures, anything that could make a PLC crash, right? Essentially the same thing here. Architecture in terms of logic solvers, same as it would be for redundant sensors, same as it would be for redundant final control elements. Uh, you have one or two or three and you got a certain number of them that will fail in order to cause uh, a trip situation. Uh, where did this, uh, these last few slides, let me just kind of quick do here and see where I'm at. Integrity pressure system. Yes. Page 45. So here is an example of a system that used redundant architecture is that uh, high integrity pressure protection system or HIPS as they call it here. And you'll see we have uh, pressure switch, pressure switch, pressure switch. So three pressure switches. Uh, we got two valves here, 
and we've got some logic here that says two out of three of these have to fail, one out of two of the PLCs has to fail, or two out of two of the ESD valves uh, have to fail. So this is just for informational purposes, uh, a high integrity pressure protection system. And it's basically a pressure relief system that limits the amount of gas sent to flare and thus lowers the environmental impact. And I threw this in here because uh, oil and gas, flaring, all that kind of stuff, nobody likes to see it. Uh, and this is kind of one of those systems that you use, uh, you use to kind of prevent that issue. How do we verify stuff? I believe this is objective four now, getting towards the end. Uh, and I think there's only a couple of quick slides on here. Uh, verification is simply the process of calculating the average probability of failure on demand and the architectural constraints for a safety integration integrated function to see if it meets requirements. And this is all related to that formula and it's a wonderful uh, math chart. So I'll let you read that. This is nothing terribly uh, significant to our lives as instrument and control technicians. Okay, finally, I believe, not last but not least, or very close to last but not least, modification and decommissioning of the SIS system. So if we do any modifications to our basic control system or our SIS system that's been applied to our, our vessel that we saw on the first slide, that changes everything, right? We add, an, we add something to it, uh, it's going to multiply our uh, SIF by a factor of 10. We take something away, it's going to reduce our factor by a, a factor of 10 or some factor, hypothetically. Um, so if we do any modifications, we have to follow a specific procedure, which will involve reassessing all our functions, uh, or redetermining its new safety integrity level, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if decommissioning devices, the sill must be maintained or recalculated and recorded. So again, just like we had change management in, in PLCs or other things here, anytime we do changes, we have to make sure that we document it and we make uh, the pertinent adjustments to the, uh, to the safety system. <clears throat> and there you go. That is the end, my friend.